Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 309, the Casual Friday, the I Hope We Have News to Tell You edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Congan. Today is July 21st, 2017. about the weather a lot but it's humid here and when i say humid i walk to the car and i'm full of sweat humid and it's really affected my ability to tape today's show because my mind begins to wander maybe because i'm dehydrated or something uh this is our third taping george kevin i don't think humidity has anything to do with your mind wandering i think it's It's a function of age Uh, (laughs) Age. i I am you i'm as used to humidity as a human body can be and my wine bonders continuously. <laughs> it's age. It's the humidity. It's Friday. I don't. I just want to be outside playing on the on the beach. Uh, yeah, I, I guess it's a, a lots of different things. So let's try and get this show done properly. Um, first, how's mom and dad doing? Uh health wise, uh, poor, but mm. uh, no news. Uh, uh, my mother uh, made a visit home from the emergency room. At this point, that's how we look at it. She spends yes. more time there. Oh. But uh, so we we go forward week by week, day by mm-hmm. day. Sure. Uh, my mom and dad are doing well. Uh, we talk about our parents uh, off camera a lot because uh, we're at that age in our fifties where mom and dads are are uh, uh, getting towards the elderly age where they uh, get medical care frequently or call us frequently for help or. And uh, but they don't want to. They don't want to be a burden. But by not being a burden, they're being a burden. And uh, because they won't tell you when they need to tell you that they have issues that they want to talk about. It's a paradox, George. Uh, on to more paradoxical news. I think uh, we, there's not a lot of news stories today. But uh, let's talk a little bit about a press release that came from the Diocese of Los Angeles about Bishop Bruno and his big, big win, George. Yeah, Diocese of Los Angeles last week released a press statement that was picked up into a news story by the LA Times and a bunch of other outlets that essentially said that Bishop Bruno now has the right to sell the property. Court rules in his favor. Woo! Now when I Yay, saw, all right, you, Bishop Bruno. And now, when I saw this appear across the, the tick, well, we don't have tickers anymore. But you know, no, we don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it did appear, appear across the ticker tape. And, and the... Uh, the uh, AP machine, the, but I didn't have three bells go off. Um, I thought, man, that was, I mean, my goodness, that was a surprise. Well, then I read the article, and then I was quick to pick up, and then I actually dug into it. And the Diocese of Los Angeles, it's not fake news, but it is spun so badly that uh, I think they would be spit on that on that baseball if it was thrown. I got to so, tell you what, it, it deserves a Pulitzer for the uh, the rewriting of fake news, George. What happened was about, you know, in, there are several Bruno law cases. He's not just restricted to the Episcopal Church. It's hearing pen. One of the cases he had was with uh, a company that donated the land back in the 40s to the Episcopal Church to build St. James Newport Beach. When it was donated, a codicil was put on saying that if the church is no longer in existence or whatnot, you can't sell the land for commercial development. You have to give it back to us, the original commercial developers. It's only for religious purposes. So that means if the Episcopal Church sold it to the Presbyterians, that'd be fine. But to build condos, no, that's not fine. So what happened? When all this started, the developers filed a lawsuit. And Bishop Bruno filed a counter lawsuit saying slander of title and all this and that. And this went up to the court through the courts and the courts held, well, unfortunately, since the 40s, the law has changed. And when you've got a codicil like this, it has to be renewed every 25 years in the recorder of deeds office. We're at the equivalent in Orange County, California. And what happened last week was that the Superior Court said, yes, we're going to uphold the lower court ruling that Bishop Bruno uh, doesn't have to turn the property back over 
to the developer, original developer, he can do with it whatever he wants. Oh, and by the way, in his uh, in his other lawsuit against the developer, he's lost and he has to pay them $108,000 in their legal fees. Yeah, now, the, the cost I, of law well, in California is amazing. $108,000? $8,000? $8, if I were, um, see, have, and the L.A. press release played up the fact that uh, an appeals court affirmed a lower court ruling, which nobody expected otherwise, but they neglected to give due uh, prominence to the fact that Bishop Bruno is now another $108,000 in the hole. And this has nothing to do whatsoever with the church case, ecclesial case because Bishop Bruno has been stripped of his authority by the presiding bishop to sell the property. So, no, Bishop Bruno doesn't have the authority to sell the property, the di uh, as the newspaper reported, because Bishop Bruno has been sacked from that authority. So, it's I, not a fake news story, but it's as slimy as it comes from the Diocese of Los Angeles Press Office. And I just want to add something, Kevin. One of the things that has come out is that there's more than one villain in this story. John Bruno is a larger-than-life James Bond villain, quality villain. You know, he, you, If you saw him in a fictional book as a character, you would have the blank scared out of you. Uh, well, no. His suffragan, Mary Glasspool, said that he scared the shit out of her. Uh, but what has come out is that Bishop Bruno... The Standing Committee of the Diocese of Los Angeles, I believe, will be liable for ecclesiastical sanctions because it has colluded with the bishop in so many ways. It has abdicated its responsibilities. Uh, most recently, Bishop Bruno asked them for permission to sell the property, uh, and they said, sure, but they didn't ask to whom, and how much, and under what terms. I'm on, I'm on Central Florida's board. I mean, I know a bit about this, because if somebody sells property in Central Florida, any parish, any institution, a diocesan entity, it has to come before the board, and we ask, who are you selling it to? How much is it? In other words, are you selling this to your nephew for 20% under retail so he can flip it and make some money? This Los Angeles has not been doing that with John Bruno. And they have... Now, attrition will get rid of some of them, but really, the Diocese of Los Angeles should look carefully at its leadership because Bishop Bruno, I believe, has corrupted them. And I think it's, you know, it's not something new. Over time, they've just become the rubber stamp uh, yes. in all different areas. The real estate areas, uh, the, uh, the diocese staff areas, the diocese house areas, um, obviously the press office who can really write a, a new story badly. Um, it's just something that's happened so long over time is so corrupt. Hopefully attrition will take care of this, but uh, and, I'm not so it's also, sure. It's also a bit incestuous, too. I mean, the Bishop Bruno's lawyer in his uh, hearing panel appeal, this woman, is also the deputy diocesan chancellor, and she's also on the standing committee approving these sales. Hmm. I mean, this is beginning to sound like the Clinton White House in some respects. You know, uh, co-conspirators are also lawyers are also this and that and the other. And yeah, it's just, yeah. it's, 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 the church attorney, the Episcopal Church is church attorney, an outside independent party retained to represent the, the interests of the Episcopal Church, has concluded that this whole thing stinks, and a forensic audit is required to go through it, a criminal audit, because otherwise, uh, this, this is a former federal prosecutor, so this is a guy who has a nose for uh, racketeering and corrupt practices, and this when, is what he's thinking. Yeah, when there's smoke, there's diocese. fire. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he took one little look and said, "Oh my gosh, you guys are going down." And yeah, to suggest it uh, is amazing. Hopefully, they do they do have the audit? Hopefully, those who have had shenanigans uh, get found uh, guilty. And uh, I'm not saying any one person. I have no intimate knowledge no. of who did what, when, where, and how. Yeah, I'm only. I'm only repeating what I read in the church attorney's pleadings and the other pleadings. Hmm. But, Kevin, I agree, this thing stinks. And this has got nothing to do with 
the issues, which is the next topic, which is GAFCON. Uh, this is not a liberal conservative. Um, Cindy uh, uh, Voorhees, uh, the vicar of St. James, Newport Beach, would probably be put in the liberal Episcopal camp. Mm-hmm. Yet she has built a congregation. She's a successful, dynamic, positive priest that any half-normal bishop would want in his diocese. And she supports all of the things the Diocese of Los Angeles and the liberal agenda is for. Yet Bishop Bruno has sought to destroy her as well. That's crazy. I, I don't understand. I mean, what we saw this in Pennsylvania. I mean, uh, it, it's a, a strange world when you... Uh, Put people into the office of bishop who are not above reproach. Who well, I really, in mm-hmm. Charles Bennett's case, I really think you know. When I went through the ordination process, I had to have psychiatric and psychological evaluations. Mm-hmm. I really think they should do that when you become a bishop. Yes, because <laughs> you know, if you're ordained in your early twenties, a lot of stuff can happen by the time you're in your 50s. Yes. Schizophrenia, megalomania, all this wonderful Uh, stuff. We did a pre-show. This is actually our third taping. I don't know if people know that or not. Um, Oh, yeah, we mentioned how brain dead I was on Friday. And so uh, during our pre-show, we talked about the branding issue with the Anglican Communion. Um, Over the last 40 years, one of the big issues um, were, I want to be affiliated with Canterbury. I want them to recognize our ministry, our church, um, and to be in communion with them, because that means we're Anglican. Uh, The uh, Archbishop of Canterbury gets to control through who he invites to the primates meeting and to Lambeth, what is and what is not Anglican. And I remember early on in, in these battles over lawsuits and theology and going to the primates meetings around the world that everybody was concerned whether or not um, they would get that invitation uh, to Lambeth because that would establish them as Anglican. And we're bringing this up uh, real quick because uh, I saw a bishop post that he got his save the date invitation from uh, the Church of England for the next Lambeth, George. July 23rd to August 4th, 2020 was an invitation no but it invitation. was just sort of, you know just sort of keep your calendar open for that time yeah so that allows uh, people to be uh disinvited because they've never been invited and then yeah. that and then if uh the acna bishops uh are to come then they can get an invitation but that, they didn't get anything so far order blue tent uh, and pay for it. <laughs> What's that? Oh, pay for it. Well, they don't do that at Lambeth. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. That, that's an need... inside joke. Last Lambeth conference, they had a blue marquee tent. I think it was a quarter of a million pounds or something, and they forgot to pay for it or budget for it. Uh, oops, oops. Where did that come from? Big oops. Uh, big oops. Now, they had it at Kent University last time, or Kent, uh, yeah, University. Kent. Is that where they always have it? I mean, I've only been to one Lambeth. You've been to two, three, four, or five, right? We used to have them at Westminster Abbey. That's right. Okay, right. Then in the uh, seven, I think seventy-eight was the first one at the University of Kent at Canterbury. The University of Kent at Canterbury is a god awful, ugly, seventies, sixties university, and the way it was laid out was that in case there's student riots or a student rebellion, the police can get there with water cannons and clear the, the place. It's really ugly. The, it's the ugly. hillside, yeah. It, I mean, I was there, and I had to stay in, in the dormitories. And this is when they had the heat wave uh, for the last Lambeth. And literally, it was 95, 96, 97 degrees, and that seldom happens over in England. There's no AC in the dormitories. I was dying. I was on the third floor. Heat rises. And I just hung it out in the press room. I would get up in the morning at 7 a.m., run over, and just be chilled by this uh, AC press room in in the university. I uh, rented a house with uh, reporter Ruth Gledhill from The Times Mm -hmm. and a reporter from The Guardian. The three of us shared a house that had a swimming pool uh, right on the outskirts of Canterbury. (laughs) Okay, I'm doing and, it wrong. <laughs> and we had uh, daily, we had daily, almost daily cocktail parties uh, at, at the place by the poolside. And uh, 
Uh-huh. Uh, it, it was pleasant there, Kevin. I this time around, I think you should. We should rent house and not. We will do an Airbnb uh, in July 2020 uh, on the outskirts either of a uh, uh, University of Kent or uh, the Abbey. We'll see what happens. Uh, back to our topic on uh, the. I want to be affiliated with the the. Um, Archbishop of Canterbury. Yeah. Uh, one of the things yeah, the that Episcopal Church of the United States of America was not affiliated with the Archbishop of Canterbury for about the first eighty years of its presence. Do Episcopal I agree? Priests, yeah. I mean, uh, this whole notion of having some relationship with the Archbishop of Canterbury is a late nineteenth, twentieth century innovation. Uh, it has no foundation in any Anglican formularies whatsoever. It's not me- and, and the arch- it's just a little modern thing that has come up. It's, well, I thought somebody from VTS or somebody wrote a paper, and the, that a paper uh, the Virginia made the document. Yeah, Virginia document, nineteen eighty-eight, was the study put together uh, that basically came up with the uh, concept of three instruments of unity, four instruments of unity: Canterbury, uh, primates. Lambeth Conference and the Anglican Consultative Council. The ACC itself only came about in the late 1960s, for example. And the Virginia report was presented to the Lambeth Conference in 98, and it was rejected. So <laughs> we don't actually, and so there, it doesn't mean anything other than, than a, a nice, pious attempt. And since then, we have no working understanding of what it means. Now, we have national canons. The Church of England says that it determines who it's in communion with. Mm-hmm. The Episcopal Church determines who it's in communion with. And the fact that you're in communion or out of communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury has no bearing whatsoever with the description of being Anglican. Because if you look at the history of the Episcopal Church of the USA, there were only three Episcopal churches of, up until the 1860s. There was the Church of England, which was in England and everywhere else, the mm-hmm. Scottish Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church of the USA. The Scottish Episcopal Church in the... Eight, I, this was my dissertation topic. Apparently, uh, you're just like... You, you pulled this well, off. Instance, I'm like, George, there was a you big, know your topic, don't stink. you? There was a big stink <laughs> in the 1860s when a bishop of Edinburgh, the Scottish Episcopal Church, was appointed a bishop of Gibraltar in Europe. Mm-hmm. And the Church of England and the Parliament got involved because... This man is not a real bishop. He's a Scottish Episcopalian. Now, we may have gone to the same schools. We may believe the same thing. We may use slightly different prayer books, but we're not in... He's not, done, he's not one of us. Um, so this whole notion of Canterbury being the focus of everything is an academic's attempt to fudge reality. And it's just... For instance, the Church of Nigeria uh, eight, nine years ago um, changed its constitution to remove any reference to the Archbishop of Canterbury and to focus on the Anglican formularies. And people at that time got all hot and bothered. But if you look at the Episcopal Church's formularies, it's got, you know. Well, there it comes. I'm running off the mouth, Kevin. Stop me. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, no, you're doing good. I mean, but there's, now we've just arrived with the biggest problem. The biggest problem is things like the Dennis Canon, which don't get passed, but make its way into the law of the church, where this document, which was denied and thrown out, oh, that's stupid, we don't need to be in uh, concert with Canterbury or recognized by Canterbury to be Anglican, thrown out, yet slowly becomes part of the architecture, part of you know how things work within the, the, the big boy system here. Well, you want to be Anglican, you better hope that Justin Welby likes you and invites you to Lambeth and that you have a purple collar because that's how we know. Now, we uh, remember when Roland Williams, uh, in response to a question, said, you know, it's no longer about just Canterbury choosing who is Anglican and who's not. It's kind of, you know, uh, a workflow of who has relationships with who diocese upon diocese upon diocese if you have relationships uh with other dioceses um well that kind of is anglicanism 
and um, it's not limited to who Rowan Williams gets to choose or Justin Welby gets to choose. There's a, a synergy about uh, an internal recognition system, George. And that's how I believe it should be, because it's an organic relationship. And that's basically the argument the ACNA and GAFCON has put forward about how Anglicanism should work. And it's not accepted by all people by any means, but it's an evolving understanding. Um, problem that we're having right now, as I see it, is that the dialogue is stopped. Justin, people, Justin Welby will talk. I hear this 12th hand. Okay, sure. uh, I think I think I heard my mother-in-law told me. So, uh, <laughs> Justin Welby is having conversations with all sorts of people, not with you and me, and he stopped listening. He basically is at the point where he knows what the other side is going to say. He's already disapproved. He, he doesn't agree with it. He's just being polite and marking off. Yes, I went through the note motions of talking to people. Justin Welby's first interest is the preservation of the Church of England as it currently exists, not the Anglican Communion. And he has discovered that those two goals are not the same thing. The salvation of the Church of England in his mind means accommodating it to the culture of England and to the politics of England. And when you have the Conservative Party's Prime Minister Theresa May saying she thinks that the Church of England should rethink its opposition to gay marriage and so on and so forth, and you've got the Labour Party saying, well, we really should disestablish the Church of England. Justin Welby's got a problem. How do you keep his institution alive? Now, for me, the answer is disestablishment. And, you know, <laughs> the time has but come. But Justin, you know, yeah. that's that's not one of the uh, not one of his options right now. So he's got to compromise the Church, mute its witness, and. It's one of the things Gavin mentioned about the current crop of bishops and the House of Bishops of the Church of England are chosen by uh, their many kind and good men and women. But I think the outstanding characteristic that they display is conformity and fealty to authority. These are not individual movers and shakers. There are maybe some. Longer. I talked to Gavin. Here's the yeah. joke. Here's yep. the joke. Alan Wilson, the Bishop of Buckingham. And now Paul Bayes, the Bishop of Liverpool, both are on the liberal side. And they are not conformists. They are not fearful of authority. They believe and they stand for what they think is right. I happen to think they're wrong. But my goodness, these two people have more, if you will, integrity than the rest of the Church of England's bishops do. Especially, we're told time and again, well, that... Yes, in private, these conservatives think, well, this and that. But when push comes to show, when the moment comes to talk or to vote, can't trust them. No, I mean, on paper and in reality, the Church of England in its current form is over. Uh, the gospel, the people who defend the gospel, the bishops who are supposed to be defenders of Christ um, have rolled over completely. The only voice is the liberal voice. Uh, you're talking about Justin not talking anymore. Well, the, the time for Indaba is over. They had their talking points. Everybody got to sit down and discuss the issue ad nauseum. We are now to the point where uh, I don't have to talk to you anymore because the process is over. And I really didn't care what you had to say before. Anyway, this is how it's going to happen from now on. I have my enemies list. I hope you're not on it. George and I are, of course, on it. Um, but this is the, the new reality of how the Church of England, under its uh, new archbishop, is working. And uh, they're just striking out and not taking names, George. Well, Kevin, they've taken two names. <laughs> Yours and mine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, now, Rowan Way, George Carey liked us. Yes. He likes like George Carey thought we were great. Uh, Rowan Williams, uh, he would shake my hand. He would give me a little hug. Um, I don't think he knew my name, but he was very courteous. Um, and he would, uh, uh basically make barbed comments like he, at, at the Alexandria primates meeting, yeah. he said to us, uh, 
oh, you've grown some horns since I've last seen you. And I was trying to think, did he mean that we were devils? Is Karen, Kevin called bald? I don't, we're bald. It's the bald thing. It had we're, to be the bald we're, thing. Or we yeah. cuckold, because, you know, in traditional cuckolds, we're horns. Sure. And so you never quite knew with Rowan Williams. Well, Justin Welby... Uh, you know, and if you don't know, us, you're going to know, yes. Speaks of us the way Mary Glasspool speaks of John Bruno, <laughs> except he's not afraid of us, but, she, but the word shit is also <laughs> included there. We are too little. Uh, yeah, Floral. it's... Uh, so... Clearly, this Friday, we've gone way over time. We're at 25 minutes. I do need to cut the show. Next, in our pre-show, to let you guys know, we talked about Anglicanism. We talked about Gafcon. We talked to Church uh, you know, of England. Lots of different topics on a, Monday, on a Friday. And we didn't get to talk to you guys about it. Hopefully, next week, we'll talk a little bit more about Gafcon. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. Today, you've been watching episode 309 of Anglican Unscripted. You wrote it down. I appreciate that. You know, sometimes you do. And, and I'm looking over here at the monitor. You slouch, too, during this episode a little bit. That's all right. It was a bad